don't know me, my name is Cheryl Rogers and I serve at Unity Kitchener. It is my honor and privilege to serve the spiritual community and to work together with C and everybody else at Unity of Ottawa. It is also my honor and privilege now today as facilitator to welcome Reverend Ogan Holder. Now, I don't know if you were here last week, but Reverend Ogan uh, joined us last week for part one of this talk that he uh, was so wonderful. We so enjoyed it. We almost could not let him leave. We stayed over time because, and he was generous with his time. Thank you, Rev Ogan. Uh, we just had so much to share and to ask and was just overwhelmed by the wisdom that we were able to get from Reverend Ogan and from each other. So thank you to everybody who participated in that and who stayed. And we welcome you today to stay after Reverend Ogan's talk as well. Hopefully he will be able to uh, join us again and um, to have go on with a further with discussion. So let me tell you a little bit about Reverend Ogan. He is the co-founder of Project Status, a Sanctus, sorry, Ogan, Project Sanctus, a safe, brave online space to discover and be our holiest self. And in so doing, together create a world of love, justice, and liberation for all. He's an ordained unity minister, an award-winning author, and he holds certification in spiritual coaching, grief and bereavement counseling, and the Enneagram. He co-hosts two podcasts, Pub Theology Live, which is a weekly conversation on life, culture, faith, meaning, and identity, and with love and justice for all. An exploration This meeting is being recorded. Anti-racism, dismantling oppression, special uh, fostering liberation, and the special challenges that arise as spiritual seekers. And as spiritual seekers, they will arise. Welcome, Reverend Ogan. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for having me back. And thank you for all of you who are being here to share this time and space with me. Um, I don't think we need the wonderful welcome screen with my beautiful face. You can actually, you know, we got, we got me in real time here. So uh, if you want to pull that, there we go. All right. Now I can also see the vast majority of you as well. Um, so um, I am looking forward to our discussion time afterwards. I'm curious to hear about maybe your experiences this week as you to whatever extent you may have digested um, what I shared last week. I had an interesting week uh, myself and I, my week was a little bit of an emotional roller coaster. Uh, many of you are familiar with my um, background, my journey uh, with grief. In 2015, my wife died of cancer, and since then, I've lost six other people who've been fairly close to me. Um, so it's been it's been a journey, and um, I'm very familiar with how that journey looks in my own life. And for those of you on this call, I'm sure there are many of you who've lost people close to you as well. You are familiar with how your journey goes, and what I realized half the time is that. When I am experiencing what I like to call a swell of grief, oftentimes, I'd say, I know, 90% of the time, my body gets there before my brain does. What that means is I feel it happening before I'm cognitively aware that that's what's happening. So um, I began to feel that swell um, kicking in and and. And at first I was like, what's, what's happening? Why am I feeling so unmotivated to do anything? Why am I feeling so cranky and so crabby? Why is it that I just want to sit and watch hours of TV and also play Candy Crush for quite some time? By the way, broke a few Candy Crush personal records this week as a result of it. Um, but 
took me a couple days to go like, oh, I know what this is. And then to sit in it and not to try and figure out what it's about. Although I can't shut that part of my brain down as much as I try. It's all about feeling what comes up, noticing, sitting with it. And as the thinking mind starts to take over, redirect that back into the feel of it. But eventually what came up for me is that's probably what my body is feeling is the fact that on February 13th coming up, it would have been my 25th wedding anniversary. And it's interesting because I'm not going to lie to you. Some years I forget. Some years it's like, you know, I don't get to February like 21st maybe. And I was like, oh, crap, that was my anniversary would have been like a week ago. I completely forgot. So part of my grief journey is sometimes being so present in that moment of, of just resonating with what I feel and not necessarily my memory that sometimes these what we call, you know, big dates come and go and I don't always ac acknowledge them. But but this 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 time is different. So so I'm 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 in that and my interesting experience of that was as I began to feel this lack of motivation and things taking 15 times as long to do, I began to panic a little bit. And the reason I began to panic is because um, I shared I shared this link with you last week. It's my it's my sub my Substack. It's a it's a newsletter in which I write. Uh, you know, I call it my musings on life, love, loss, and liberation. So I just write a lot of things, um, and some people subscribe. Some people actually pay uh, for the subscription because um, some of the posts are you know behind a paywall. I'm using it as part of my income, part of my efforts to also keep myself disciplined to create more of a, a writing career. But I realized days were going by and I had started to write a new post and I was struggling to write this post and, and getting panicked all the time. And the narrative in my head was, if I don't get this post out, people who are paying for this are going to feel like, well, I paid for this thing and I'm not getting stuff. So I'm going to unsubscribe and therefore I'm going to lose money. And so I started panicking. Uh, I'm going to lose money because money's tight for me right now. And then I'm going to lose subscribers if I don't write. And then once again, here's this great, another great project I've started that I'm beginning to fail at. And then, so I started to kind of go down this bit of a rabbit hole, this kind of downward spiral. And of course, when I noticed that, you know, I go through, I, you know, I got my own, I got my own process for stopping the spiral. But later on, as I reflected, I realized the spiral started because of my fear of losing out on money. It started because of, you know, in, in, in spiritual circles, we'll call it, we like to call it a lack consciousness, but <laughs> I also like to call it the internalized seeds, norms, and fears of capitalism. Um, in fact, you know what? I, you know, I'll put the link here. When you get the chance, um, you can look it up. I wrote, I wrote more about it um, in greater expansive detail um, in a post. Not a long post. It was more of a, listen, y'all, I can't do this right now, and here's why. But if you still want something to read, here's another article about this similar situation that I posted two years ago in Unity Magazine. You'd think I'd learn how to walk my talk by now, but sometimes, you know, we need that extra nudge. If you remember what I said last week, Martin Luther King Jr. described the three evils of the world. He described them as poverty, racism, and militarism. And I said, um, I 100% agree. I prefer to use bell hooks terminology. Bell hooks, um, an amazing feminist writer. If you've never read her, please go read all her works. Um, but she speaks about capitalism, white supremacy, and patriarchy. And, and I'll tie all of them together in a second. But I realized that in my panic of paying more attention to my income, paying more attention to what others will think about this, paying more attention to equating my sense of self and worth by 
how much I can put out there for others to pay me for. I was living out those internalized seeds of capitalism. This is what leads to poverty. So when King talks about poverty, I think he's really um, talking about capitalism and, and how poverty slash capitalism shows up today in many different ways. Things like things like, yes, homelessness and unemployment, um, but even things like infant mortality and and uh, what else, what else, what else? Um, malnutrition, illiteracy, all these things are the unfortunate side effects of capitalism. And because of our interconnectedness, even though some of us are in much better financial places than others, not super rich, not even a little rich, but still better off financially, you know, we've got a good job or we've worked hard and planned for retirement and enjoying a good retirement, all those things. Because of our interconnectedness, there's nothing that happens to any person or group of people on this planet that we don't also feel some brunt or something of. It affects us in different ways, whether it's on a consciousness level or on a level in which you know economic uh, policy is determined that affects us as well. There, there's no getting away with it. Um, this is that you know it's that idea that we read in the scriptures. You know when Jesus said, "When you do this to the least of these, you do it to me as well." This is this is what um, that scripture I think is referring to: the fact that we are all so interconnected <laughs> that 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 one group of people cannot be exploited, hurt, marginalized without it affecting our entire sense of how we live, our entire systems of living, our sense of beingness. Um, same thing goes for, for white supremacy. Uh, you know, King talked about racism, white supremacy I think is a little more far reaching and we see it, we see it in a lot of different ways. Yes, we see it in racism um, and its cousins, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Um, we see it in when we have uh, people living under apartheid type systems. You know, we saw it in South Africa. Uh, we're seeing it in Gaza again. We're seeing it in places in China. Um, we, 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 we see it. Um, and and King, King said something really interesting. He said, uh, racism is a philosophy based on a contempt for life based on a contempt for life. Now we know life is one of our 12 powers. So there's a spiritual slash consciousness idea of the, the, the divine idea of life. But in our physical manifestation of life, right? We see the flora and fauna of the planet. Uh, we see the planet itself. And because of this disdain for life, this contempt for life, we we do harm to other people. We do harm to the planet, and none of us on this call are sitting down going like, "I hate life," or "I hate the planet," or "Really, do we need more trees?" Like none of us are sitting here saying that. However, we are all complicit in systems of existence that put a strain on the planet, and that's not easy to reconcile. Okay, it really isn't. And, you know, I'll give you an example. I may have shared this last week again, thanks to technology. I am able to sit in Barbados and do this talk with you live. I am so grateful for that. I'm very grateful I didn't have to come up, get on a plane and go to winter Canada <laughs> to come talk in front of you. Okay, so this is wonderful. And what's also true is the technology is, is the actual mechanics that allow this technology to happen. Every computer that's sitting in front of you is composed of um, you know, special metals and rare metals that have to be dug up and excavated. And a lot of those exist in very poor African nations that are going through all types of wars and struggles and people not being compensated what they're worth and, and truly next to slave labor, if not in some places, actual slave labor and child labor. So they all come at a cost. So that's, you know, we, we got cap elements of capitalism and white supremacy raised, uh, you know, all um, mixed into that. And part of, of King's work, last week when he talked about the principles of nonviolence, part of that work is 
how do we begin to really hold every one of us accountable for our part, but then also how do we begin to examine how did we get here and and what do we need to do to make things just a lot more equitable? You know, just throwing our computers out the windows, not a viable option in 2024 because we've built a life that really depends on them. Computers, cell phones, technology, TVs, all the things. So, yeah, some of us could go off the grid and disconnect ourselves, but that's just addressing us and our complicit complicitness at an individual level. It does nothing to change the collective. Uh, I, I I throw my computer out the window now and say I'm 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 done participating in technology that exploits precious metals and the people who find them. That's not going to make any kind of dent at all. It really isn't. So this is this is something much bigger, and there's no one easy answer. But part of the answer begins with having conversations and dialogues about realizing where we are in this. Uh, King also talked about militarism. And I think all militarism, all violence, is at base in patriarchy. And patriarchy is is this uh, is is built on a hierarchy of some are better than others, white supremacy to an extent too, but but patriarchy really digs into the uh, gender base, uh, superiority, el- 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 paternalism, being elite, arrogance, and and we see that play out in a lot of ways uh, um, today today as well. Even even in religion and spirituality, when we, you know, for, you know, how many religions, uh, you know, continue to see God as this masculine entity. And yet, even here in New Thought, like in Unity, we, you know, we've let go of the idea of God being a personal being or a, pers- a being long time ago. God, we talk about God's not male or female, but yet, but yet, but yet. We still, we still have this concept of divine masculine and divine feminine. We, we still create a binary for God, a gender-based binary. And when you look at the characteristics of what divine feminine and divine, ma- divine masculine are, they're suspiciously a lot like what I see as the characteristics of here's, here's, here's what men do in roles. Here's what women do in roles. And uh, when you look at those side by side, somehow it's always the women being more subservient roles and the men's roles being more leadership and authoritative. Um, So all I'm saying is, all I'm saying is a lot of times when we think we've gotten rid of a concept, all we've simply done is rename it and we shift it. But a lot of the underlying systems of oppression still exist in it. And it's not our fault because it's all we know. We were born into these systems. They're all we know. So we build everything on them, around them. They infuse everything. And it takes a lot of work to go in and deconstruct and decolonize or realize where they are embedded in us and shift them. I remember I wrote a post once about, you know, when it comes to divine mask and divine feminine, we just bought a lot of those patriarchal ideas and plopped them on top of God and divinity. Man, the pushback that I got <laughs> for, that, for that one little post was, was fascinating. But this is what happens when we hear things that that truly start to kneel at those embedded um, ideas that we have that are rooted in systems of oppression. And and King's work around nonviolence, both the principles and the steps that I'm going to share today, really allow us to dig into that work first within ourselves and then within our community. It's not easy. Easy work. It's not quick work, but it's it's what we have to do if we are if we ever have a chance of beginning to shift our world into something not based on patriarchy, white supremacy, and capitalism. So this is why I also say this is spiritual work because we gotta we we have to transform ourselves not first but along the way. And why I say not first, because many of us may sit and go like, you know what, once I'm done my inner work, then I'm jumping in. Or I have more inner work to do, so let me focus primarily on myself, and then, you know, I'll do what I can do on the side. 
And my invitation to you is to know that we can walk and chew gum at the same time. And a lot of times our inner work is, we, we won't know where to go in our inner work unless we are working in community with others, unless something happens outside of ourselves to trigger that inner work. So it's a both and, not an either or. So let me jump in with a quick um, a quick recap of what we did, uh, what we covered last week. And some of you will remember these. We talked about the six principles of nonviolence, um, being a way of life for courageous people, about nonviolence, seeking to win friendship and understanding, it's seeking to in defeat injustice, not people. Um, it holds that unearned voluntary suffering uh, for just cause can educate and transform. Um, it loses, uh, sorry, nonviolence chooses love instead of hate, and nonviolence believes that universe is on the side of justice. If you missed last week's talk, you can go back and, and re-listen and um, get a deeper sense. You can also read... Uh, King's very first uh, publication. Uh, oh, let me scroll about the name is escaping me right now. Um, but Strike Toward Freedom, that's what it is. His very first publication, Strike Toward Freedom, is where he sort of outlines these. So, you know, take, take it directly from the source. But then the question always becomes, principles are great, but how do we actually live them? How do we put them into play in our lives? Um, a lot of spiritual teachings are great about sharing the principles, but maybe a little light on how we actually, you know, live them. So this is what we're going to um, dive into a little bit more today. Uh, the six steps of nonviolent social change. We've had the principle, so now we're going to explore some of the steps. And the first step is information gathering. Um, we, in order to understand and articulate both to ourselves and others an issue or a problem or an injustice, uh, um, we got to do some research. And research this day and age is kind of fascinating, right? Because we, <laughs> I don't know if y'all been on the internet recently, but it's kind of the wild, wild west out there. And there's a lot of biased information out there. And what a lot of us have gotten in the habit of doing is we find the information that supports the point that we've already decided is the right one. So we, we do it backwards. We don't get the information and then educate ourselves and then go like, oh, so this sort of means this. No, no, no. We go like, okay, I know what the right thing is. Let me go find the information that supports my view. And if I find information that doesn't, I'm chucking it out the window because that information can't be right. Those people don't know what they're talking about. So we go through this process. But, but what I'd like us to do is step back and take a more objective um, approach. So yes, let's gather the information. Let's investigate. And investigate from all sides of the argument. Remember, this isn't about trying to um, undo or unmake people. It's about it's about what he called what he called evil. What he called you know what I'll call things based on these systems of white supremacy, capitalism, and patriarchy. So the idea is to is to gather in research, gather information um, on all sides of the argument, and then that's where the education comes from. Um, because when we educate ourselves in gathering after gathering information. It minimizes our misunderstanding of what's going on. And that's when I say minimizes our misunderstanding, that applies to both sides. It applies to, to whether uh, we find information that supports our point of view or we find information that doesn't. It allows us to understand when those people, the ones who don't share our totally correct point of view, uh, it helps us to understand where they are coming from. Because honestly, underneath it all, and this is the hard part for us to remember, underneath it all, there are people who want to feel safe, who want to feel connected, who want to feel loved want to feel safe, connected, and loved. There's, I, I've not met a human being on the planet, regardless of their political or philosophical views, who doesn't want this. How we get to those things, that's where we differ on. 
So when we can understand that perhaps their and our points of view on how we get to these things differ, then perhaps we can work, begin to sort of work backwards and go like, ah, I see where they're coming from. I see how they arrived at that. I may not agree with it. And now I am informed and educated to perhaps have a substantive discussion with them, or at least with my friends about the issue, maybe help educate those in my circle who are misinformed. And like I said before, this is a lot of work. It's a long journey. So what really matters is our personal commitment. And this involves really being honest and checking in with ourselves around, am I doing what it takes today, in this moment, in this week, in this, in this month, in this year, where I live, where I work? Am I truly living these principles of nonviolence? Am I truly being that voice, being that presence for nonviolence? Am I standing up in the face of white supremacy, capitalism, and patriarchy, however it might look, wherever I am in any given moment? Um, and, and part of that personal uh, commitment is realizing that, and I mentioned this last week, as we are those faces and voices of justice, it will, could potentially bring harm to us as well. And that harm may not always be violent harm, that harm may be exclusion, that harm may be uh, disconnection, um, you know, and it, in some cases, it might literally be our job um, or, or, or uh, cost us family members. Are we, is our personal commitment at the level where we're willing to say yes to that, regardless of what may come our way? And there's no right or wrong answer to that. There are some people in my life I'm prepared to lose. There are some people in my life I'm not. And I and it, it it becomes a situation where when I'm with the people that I'm not prepared to lose, even if they don't agree with me, what's our conversation going to look like? How do we how do we bridge a gap of differing views and still love each other, still be there for each other, still be in each other's lives without compromising our values and our beliefs? So it's not as easy just saying, oh, yes, if they don't agree with me, they're out of my life. That's that's not realistic. And also, that's also not being centered in love, which King talked about non-finance being. It is, it's a love-centered uh, way of being. Uh, so I mentioned how do we bridge that gap? That's what negotiation is all about. Uh, and... Negotiation is about using intelligence, which we, you know, we get from our information, our education, but it's also using uh, grace and humor. It's also using empathy. It's about looking, looking for, for the positive. It's about realizing that this isn't about making that person wrong. It's really about, again, you know, in unity, we talk about, we, we, the, we, we see the, the Christ in each other. We see the divine in each other. We realize that at our core, we are the same. And at our core, because we are the same, that means, again, we want to ultimately experience the same things. We want, we want safety. We want connection. We want to be loved. And if we can um, have our conversations centered in love around those things, then that, that, begins, to, that begins to shift. And here's the interesting thing we have to realize. That shift in is not just on their part, it's on our part as well. Uh, because many of us get in that place of mm, sort of spiritual righteous arrogance <laughs> about what we believe. And anytime something is centered around rightness, not righteousness, but rightness, and arrogance and a hierarchy, as in this way is better than your way, then this these are these are just symptoms of patriarchy. These are symptoms of of white supremacy. They're embedded in us, even if they're looking good because of what we value and what we believe. 
uh, then then we do direct action. Okay, and this is when you know there's uh, there's kind of two two aspects to this. There's um, if we're in discussion with someone or interacting with someone, and um, they don't want to stay in that discussion, they're the ones, or we're the ones who just walk off and say, you know, I'm right about this. Can't talk with you about this. I'm I'm out of here. So there's 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 that's that's this this is following when there's sort of this kind of impasse. What do what do what do we do then? Um, and there are many ways we can be in direct action against symptoms of oppression, and uh, sometimes in that conflict with other people or other systems, you know, there's 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 a tension, and I like to say that the the tension is really where the shifting and the work happens. Um, when you think about when you think about food, unless you're eating something that you know occurs naturally, but even if you do that, there has to be some sort of tension to break the food down. So whether we're cooking the food, you know, stirring, heating, cutting, whatever, or we just chewing the food, you know, in our mouths, there there is some tension that has to be applied in order for a shift to happen. And I know that you know we in New Thought Spiritual Circles we don't we don't like a lot of tension we don't like a lot of discomfort, um, but but that's what has to happen. We have to live in that tension that that creative dissonance uh, within ourselves. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, I love the technology that we have uh, available to ourselves today, and. At the same time, I understand that I'm being complicit in what it takes to build this technology, but I don't want to get rid of the technology. I can't. Uh, this is how I make my living. So you're saying I'm making my living by being complicit in systems that harm other people? Yes, I am. What do I do about that? That's the tension I'm talking about. <laughs> there's there is no easy resolution there. I hope you're not looking to me for answers. Um, there's no easy resolution there, but that but that that tension that we live in, that's that's how we live in a place that really invites us again into that personal deconstruction, into that, into that decolonization, into that reorganization of our, of our beliefs and our values and shifting them and, and seeing then where we can be in direct action or indirect action even to begin to shift things. Um, perhaps the thing that we need to jump into next has been created yet or definitely hasn't. Perhaps one of us is the one who creates it. I don't know, not individually, but also collectively. But we're not going to get there unless we sit in the tension of it all. And as we do our work towards social change, as we engage in direct action, we also don't have to do it all. Uh, over in Project Sanctus, we tell people a lot, just pick your lane. Pick whatever lane you want to work, you want to do your work in. Okay, your lane might be just like, I have a lot of economic resources, so I'm going to donate to other um, places. Your lane might be, you know, in my workplace uh, or in my community or in my family. We're not having a lot of conversations about these issues. So maybe my lane is just to engage people in the conversation. Perhaps my lane is to start an organization or a nonprofit or something that addresses a specific need in my community right in front of me. You don't got to go global to be effective. There's plenty of things happening right in your own backyard. Um, so whatever lane you feel drawn to, inspired to, whatever the need is there that you believe you can play a part in shifting, that's your lane. So so know that it's know that it's enough. Often we get overwhelmed by going, there's so much atrocity in the world that this one little thing I'm doing doesn't seem to be making a difference. And we feel hopelessness and despair sets in. I think I shared this last week. Hopelessness is a lie of oppression. Do not believe in it. Because everything that we do, every little bit helps. <laughs> every little bit helps. I think you're all familiar with the story of the starfish. You know, all the starfish are washed up on the beach. And there's this little boy just throwing them in one by one. And there's like thousands of them. And this man says, you're never going to get them all what you're doing is not making a difference. And as he chucks another starfish in, the boy says to the man, it made a difference to that one. So know that you can't save it all. However, what you can do is a salvation to someone. 
So find your lane and stick in it. And then this last step, uh, reconciliation. Um, he writes that nonviolence seeks friendship and understanding with those who we might oppose. It's not about defeating the purpose, uh, defeating in the person, but it's really um, directed against, again, the systems and oppressive policies and unjust acts. And the, the sort of a, um, paradox to this is that when we talk about not defeating the person, I'm not necessarily referring to uh, elected officials because some elected officials who create horrible policies uh, you probably should be defeated at the polls. That's where that's where we do any defeat at the polls. We use the power of our, our votes in the system of democracy that uh, we have been fortunate to have. It's a flawed system, but it's the one that we have. Um, and perhaps that's the that's again one of those direct action links that you can maybe take in. Or, or, or the are the folks in your circle, family, friends, workplace, are they are they politically engaged? And they might not be because they're like, it doesn't matter who we vote for, things things aren't really shifting. And we know there's a difference when depending on who is in office. <laughs> In our political leadership, we know that it makes a difference. So perhaps that's that's your lane. Um, but the idea of reconciliation is coming to a place, hopefully, where we all realize that that we're all not just complicit, but also that we're interconnected, and no matter what we do, it affects us all. So so can we come together? and take steps toward doing less harm to ourselves and each other? Can we take steps closer towards beloved community? We work on this collectively, but we also work on this individually. We have to, like I said, do the deconstruction and decolonizing work within ourselves, create beloved community within ourselves and what we tend to do in in a lot of spiritual spaces often is that we focus so much on our inner work our inner work is important of course it begins with that and let's not get stuck just doing the inner work let's shift it into the steps actionable steps tangible steps steps that occur with outside of ourselves that often, as we work on them, allow us to discover more of what's uncomfortable within ourselves and leads us into doing more in our spiritual work, more transformative work. This is, this is sort of like the, the, the loop that we're in. Our inner transformation leads to outer transformation, which triggers even more inner transformation, which triggers even more outer transformation. And we're, we're, we're in the spiral of transformation spiraling upwards. So remember that even though we may be, uh, as like to, uh, as my shirt says, uh, children, children of the same universe, we might be children of the same universe, the concept of oneness, but our experiences are not universal. We may be children of the same universe, but our experiences, our lives here on earth, in this five century realm, are not universal. We know that they're not. And in, in, in taking steps towards beloved community, what we're simply trying to do is create an experience that trends towards universality of equity, the universality of abundance, the universality of justice, the universality of love, of acceptance. These are what beloved community is really all about. So my invitation to you this week is to ask yourself, not just where am I in terms of these principles, but more importantly, where am I along the way of enacting these steps, of putting the steps into place so that my life is about building community. And once again, as always, this isn't about trying to make yourself feel bad or feel in shame or embarrassment. 
It's about assessing where you are now and knowing that you are not in this alone and making the steps towards that beloved community. Um, speaking of not being alone, I want to uh, reshare these two links that I think I shared last week. Um, some um, places within Project Sanctus where you can find community uh, to do this work with. Um, and if you also want to do some work on your own in terms of information and education, um, there's an option for that too. The Conscious Anti-Racism Part 1 program uh, is really about that. So um, uh, I'm pretty sure those of you, most of you, if not all of you on this call, have done a fair share of educating and information gathering over the years. Um, so I trust that you've got a good base. And if you'd like to dig in some more, here's just two of a plethora of options out there. So that's my invitation to you this week. Where are you in creating beloved community? both within yourself and with those around you and within the world. And trust that the work that you're putting in, the transformation that you're undergoing collectively and individually is indeed making a difference, is indeed creating heaven on earth, is indeed creating a world of love, justice, and equity for all, is indeed making that spiritual ideal and concept of oneness something that we can experience in the here and now. So let's take this into a time of meditation. And I'll invite you as I did last week, as you gently close your eyes and connect with your breath, notice what's happening in your body now. Notice parts of you that are resonating with what was just said, parts of you that are feeling uncomfortable with what was just said. Just notice, notice, notice. So let's do that for a few moments in silence. Just breathe and notice. And as you notice any points of discomfort or tension, I invite you to simply breathe a little more into those spaces with gratitude. Because the discomfort is simply an invitation into deeper learning, into deeper self-knowledge, into deeper self-acceptance, into deeper self-love. Our places of emotional and spiritual discomfort are truly our wounds inviting us to deeper healing. And our deeper healing comes as a result of understanding our unmet need and knowing that at the core of it all, the true need we have is love. So for a few moments, let us rest in the silent affirmation of knowing that I am love. I am all that I seek. I am love and I am all that I seek. And from that love, we also affirm for each and every one of us, I am transformative justice. I am beloved community. I am transformative justice. I am beloved community.
And so we go forth. We go forth as the embodiment and the ambassadors of love, of justice, of beloved community. And in so doing, we heal ourselves and we heal the world. So it is. So let it be. Thank you so much.